Hey everyone, welcome to Victory Church Online. As always, we're so grateful that you're joining us here on this platform. We hope you enjoy today's sermon. Hey, man, welcome to everybody online watching. We're so glad that you've joined us today. Uh, I've got some special guests with us. Our spiritual board, our overseers are here. Let me introduce them to you real quickly. I'm going to take our eldest, Pastor Rod and Marvelous Mary. Stand up real quickly. I know they're going to see you in just a moment. They have been with us on our spiritual journey, really, from the very beginning as overseers in our church, spiritual board. They've been such a comfort to us. We're in covenant together. And uh, I've known them for 40, well over 40 years, and they've watched our spiritual journey, and they've been a great strength to Jeannie and I. And uh, really, the success of our ministry has been, been because of men like this that have been in our lives and in our church. And so we're so glad you're here. Marvelous Mary, thank you for being here and spending time with us. And we have Pastor Mark Harrell and Jeanette. His wife is over there. They don't need marriage counseling, but she's visiting with Jeannie. We go back 40 plus years also, and uh, we're in covenant together, and um, great men of God. Then I have my pastor with us, Pastor Larry Stockstill, and uh, I'm going to have him come in just a moment, but he's going to be sharing the Word of God today. And uh, we go back a long way too, I mean back into our 20s, and now we're about 70 years old, so God help us, right? But... Um, we have traveled the world together over the last 10 years and have preached and ministered to countless uh, pastors, leaders, and he's just been a great friend over these many, many years and decades. He's my pastor, and I'm so honored that he and this whole team would be here this morning to share with you and uh, share the Word of God. Would you mind doing this? Would you mind standing up and giving a great Victory Church welcome to our overseers, Pastor Larry Stocksteel? Amen. Thank you. May be seated. You guys back there, give me all the juice you got on this in-ear monitor. I appreciate it. I've been nursing a little bit of a throat issue, but this too shall come to pass. Amen. So Mike was talking about how old we are, and uh, Mike was in his late 20s or early 30s. Matt was about 8 and 9, and when we built our building down there in Baton Rouge, and uh, I just have to say, you know, that Mike has held his age well. He's the only 70-year-old that has an ascending hairline instead of receding. But Mike does say that he's so old that when he was born, the Dead Sea wasn't even sick yet. We love you guys this morning, Rod, Mark. We are here to bless you, love you, January 1st. What an amazing time. And just looking forward, you know what I love about today? It says, remember not the things of the past, but looking forward to those things that are ahead. I press on to the prize of the high calling in Christ. I have a short message today, but people are going to be saved and then after my message, I'm going to host a members meeting for all of you that are regulars here. If you're a first-time guest, second-time guest, after I have the altar call and people get saved, we're going to give you the opportunity to slip out if you need to. But all our members, just be prepared. At the end of the service, I'd like to take you through a little exercise together for the first of the year for this church. Years ago, my wife gave me a German watch. And... It was a weird watch. It was solar powered, so it had no battery. And it reset itself by focusing on a tower here in the United States. It was a radio control watch. And the tower happens to be in Fort Collins. So as I went about my day, my watch would pick up that tower up here in Fort Collins and just keep the time perfect. And if the watch ever got low on power, you had to put it in a window, let the sun shine on it. It would recharge. And it was great. It was amazing. I took it with me to Japan for Mike and I spoke in Manila, 
Singapore, and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. 18 days. When we landed in Japan to make our transfer, I looked down at my watch. I saw something cool. All the hands started turning automatically because it picked up a different tower in Japan. So you didn't even ever have to set your watch. You just moved around the world from tower to tower, and it would set your watch to that time zone. So it was a nice watch. Melanie told me that she paid about $800 for it. I would have never let her do that, but she did. So I get back to Baton Rouge from that trip, and of course my watch should have reset itself to the time here in the United States. Check in with Fort Collins Tower, boom, change it to Central Time, and that, that's it. And it, it wouldn't do it. That watch stayed on Japanese time. My body came home, but my watch stayed in Japan. <laughs> well, who, who wants to add 14 hours every time they look at their watch and add 14 hours? That's how far Japan is ahead of us. I thought I tried, I huffed, I puffed, I called, I inter interviewed people, I called jewelers, I looked online, I had the, the book. Nobody could tell me why that watch would not reset. And I have to tell you, I told Melanie, look, it's been six weeks, I have to throw this watch away. It's just no good. The thing won't reset from Japanese time. And the Lord told me to call one last jeweler in Ohio, and I did. And he said, can I ask you a question? He said, are you setting that watch in a window? I said, I sure am. He said, what direction does the window face? I said, east from my house in Baton Rouge. He said, well, that's your problem right there. Like I'm a dummy, and I am when it comes to that. He said, the window has to face Fort Collins, and for you in Baton Rouge, that's west. you got to find a west window in your house, put the watch there. Well, I was leaving for a trip. I came back on Sunday night after two days, anxious to see what happened. When I picked up that watch, booyah, our phrase in Louisiana, it was perfect timing. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. Now, lesson learned. Don't throw valuable things away. They're just facing the wrong tower. I still have the watch. It's, it's functioning perfectly. But if you throw things away prematurely, maybe because they just got out of alignment and they faced the wrong direction. The world is in the wrong tower. They have locked on to a tower of lust, greed, pride, in fact, 2 Corinthians 4 says the God of this world has blinded their minds. It's like blinds man bluff. They don't even know where the tower is, and they locked on to one, but it's the wrong one. And they don't know that. You might be in here this morning, and you're facing the wrong tower. You may have messed your life up so bad that you feel like you should be thrown away, or you want to take it yourself, or you want to throw it away. I'm telling you, God has made you as a human being and if you'll just pivot and change over to the right tower, which is the cross of Jesus Christ, you're going to start feeling the hands of your heart change. How many of you felt when you got recalibrated when you got saved? Did you feel that? I did. I've been preaching 53 years and got saved years before that. And the Lord changed me, and I've been facing the cross now all these years. I do mess up. I do get mad. I do get frustrated. I do do things, but I know I'm locked onto the right tower, and that's the cross. Let me read you a scripture, if you happen to have your Bible or phone, from the last chapter of 2 Corinthians. This is a great ending to two epistles where Paul corrected that church thoroughly, about the offerings, about the gifts of the Spirit, about marriage and divorce, about all these topics in First and Second Corinthians. And then he lands the plane in the end of Second Corinthians 13 with several verses about restoration. I'm going to put them up. This is the ESV. Finally, brothers, rejoice. 
Finally, he finally got to the end of two hard epistles. Aim, look at it, say the next two words, for restoration. Aim for restoration. That's the title of this little message today. Or lock on to that tower. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. If you've got marriage problems today or family problems, God is here to heal those hurts and pains and difficulties. And through this year, give us a year. Give us this whole year. And you will see at the end of the year the massive difference. He even says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, in those parts of the world, men do kiss each other on the cheek. Don't you do that to me. I'm going to say back off or I'll cut you. <laughs> All the saints greet you. Now is my verse. Now we come to my topic, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Three little phrases. Be with you all. That's how we know Paul was from the south of the United States. He says, you all. <laughs> Father, we thank you for that verse. Let our hearts be open to be healed. And let us aim for restoration in Jesus' name. And everybody said, I love that word aim for restoration. It comes from a Greek word which don't even matter. You ain't going to remember it. I won't remember it, but it's catarizzo if you want to know. Order one at the hamburger stand after church. Catarizzo means to set a broken bone. That, that's what it meant. If you broke your wrist like I did as a kid, you go in and they set it in a cast for six weeks, three months, whatever, long term, maybe a year. You're in a cast, you're immobilized. That's the word catarizzo. Galatians 6 uses it. If you see a brother overtaken in a fault, you that are spiritual, restore. Catarizzo, such a one in the spirit of meekness. So what he's about to tell us are the three keys of restoration. The three keys of restoration. And we're going to start with God the Father. He's preeminent in the Trinity. I read about him this morning in Genesis 1. I started my readings all over again. It felt so good, like an old Etch-a-Sketch. Start all over. And in Genesis 1, God said, let there be light. And he formed the dry land and the stars and the cattle and the creeping things and the creeps and the, and the flowers. And he formed it all, and then he made man. And God made man out of love. It says the love of God the Father. The love of God the Father. I want to tell you today, if you're away from God and you're not walking toward the right tower, you are confused, the hands of your watch are so off that you don't know what to do with your life. The moment you turn to the tower, you begin picking up a signal from that cross, from the tower, booming to your heart, I love you. I love you. Can you hear that voice from the throne of God? Oh, you think God is so high and that he's invisible and he, he's kind of got his arms folded. He's looking out across to the expanse of eternity. Oh, no. He's looking right at you. And he counts the hairs of your head. What a database he has up there. Even the ones you used to have that jumped off, he knows where they are. I have babies, grandbabies, and I love to put my hand on their chest when they're sleeping, feel their little chest rise and fall. That's God's love. It's a special word in the Old Testament, hesed, H-E-S-E-D. And it's a supernatural love. God loves you. In fact, I don't think there's anywhere you can go that his love cannot find you. David said, if I make my bed in heaven, you are there. And if I even make my bed in hell, you are there. The love of God is not an ocean like we sing. But in Scripture, it says the hesed of God is higher than the highest heavens. And when God made the stars, he didn't need to make one septillion or 24 septillion stars. That's 24 with 20 zeros behind it. He didn't need to make that many. He just wanted you to be able to look up and see them. 
His love fills the heavens. And occasionally, if we'll open the spigot and turn to the tower, that love will start flowing through us. And if you're here today and you don't feel loved by God, you feel rejected, you feel judged, that's all you knew in your life is that God wants to judge folks and flick them off a tabletop. But you don't know the God I'm talking about. You turned to the wrong tower. The devil has incriminated him, blamed him, falsely accused him. that He doesn't love you. If he did, he wouldn't have let your mother die of cancer. He wouldn't have let this. And, but God has done so much just to prove to you. And I love Ephesians 2.4. But God, even when we were sinners, in his great love with which he loved us. Would you do something for me right now? Close your eyes, face the tower of the cross, and just lift up your hands and let a download of the love of God come upon you all the way to the back row. Let the soothing, hesed, healing power of the love of God, let it be like a warm bath over you and like honey going down your throat. It's his love. Tell the devil, I am not confused about the love of God. He loves me. He loves me and who I am. Thank you, Lord. Could I clap? get you to clap your hands for the love of God? But I'd just like to say secondly that that love is not something we can see. We've never seen God. No man has ever seen God. But he asked his son to go down to a fallen world, Adam and Eve, when they sinned and were expelled. He said, I need you to rescue humanity. And if you want to know Jesus, Paul said there's only one word that describes him, the grace of Jesus Christ. Grace, you see, is love expressed. He left the glories of heaven, sitting right by his father, laid aside the robes of divine privileges, and was inserted into the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. What a miracle. Inserted a body you have made for me. And she carried him nine months, and he was birthed in a little manger in Bethlehem the Son of God, the creator of the whole earth, the Word of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, stepped aside from all that he enjoyed and said, I've got to go down and rescue those people. Father, I'm going. And he did. And from the moment he got his call at 30, he started going about doing good and healing all who were oppressed. If you need healing here today, there is grace in the atonement for you to be healed. Can you say amen? amen? Whatever you need of his fullness have we all received, John 1 says, and one grace after another. You're looking at a 70-year-old person who I have just been the recipient of Jesus' grace when I failed grace when I've disappointed him and I've had to come back and say, Lord, please forgive me. And he instantly forgives me and washes me and restores me back to God's love. That's right. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're sitting here and you're saying, well, I don't know anything about grace. Well, let me describe it to you like the woman caught in adultery when the Lord just said to all those Pharisees that demanded she be stoned, hey, guys, let the one that had never sinned pick up a rock and let's start this process. And one by one, they dropped their rocks and disappeared. And he said, hadn't any man condemned you? She said, no. He said, I certainly don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. I don't know what you've done in your life. And I don't care. You've been in prison. You've defrauded people. You've lied. You've stolen. You've been unfaithful. I don't know. But I know if you turn from that wrong tower that has led you and has led you astray, and you'll say, Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, wash me like Peter when he sinned, wash me like Zacchaeus when he came out of the tree. Grace is what I need. How many of you would say, I need grace even today? Oh, Lord, I know I do. You're not looking at a perfect person. If you think I am, you just need to meet my wife. She will tell you the opposite. But how can you describe grace until you see the cross, that tower over there where they nailed his beautiful hands and his feet and raised that pole up and dropped it for six hours? They put an athlete on a cross once, not with nails, but with rope. 
in his gym shorts, and they were laughing and cutting up to see how long he could stay just hanging there on the cross with rope. Fifteen minutes, he was begging to come off that cross physically. And yet our Lord spent six long hours paying the total cost for our sin and sickness and deliverance. And then the Bible says we're crucified with him. That's grace. We died with him. We were buried with him. We even, the Bible says, have been raised with him. And can you believe it? Ephesians says we've been seated with him in heavenly places. You talk about grace to take the likes of me and you with the mess we've done and the words we've said and the actions and say, come on up here to my throne. I've sat down and I got you a seat right here by me, right next to God. It's called the throne of grace up there in heaven. He said, let us approach the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. How many of you are walking through a real difficulty right now? Would you just raise your hand up? Take both hands and lift them to the Lord. Close your eyes. Face that tower again and say, oh, Lord, I need grace in my marriage. I need grace with my children. I need you, oh, Lord, so much. I speak the grace of God upon you, and I thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. But Paul didn't stop with love and grace. He moved to that last word. This is my last point. And the fellowship. Of the Holy Spirit. By the way, any relationship can be restored with those three words. If you'll love unconditionally, if you'll forgive instantaneously with grace, and you'll start to fellowship with one another again. Don't get them out of order. You can't just start fellowshipping with people that you have sinned against or you have not loved. Or you have to start with love, grace, but then comes the one who's inside of us now. Jesus is back in heaven. He's our high priest, our mediator, our surety, our advocate, and our intercessor. Five offices. But here, the Holy Spirit is living inside of us. We've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. But that's not enough, really, because we need him to guide us every moment of every day. And so we need to learn to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And it's easy. It takes time, the inward witness, the inward voice, where you become accustomed to his voice, and you get ready to buy a big thing in the store, and inwardly you get like a red light, like a kind of a, a, a check that says don't do that. And you don't know why, but you've learned the voice of the Spirit. I think I'll just think on that for 24 hours. Then you find out it was a hoax and it was a big mess because you listened or maybe like when I walked behind my, my now wife in high school, 10 feet behind her, and the voice of the Spirit said to me, and I was in the 11th grade, he said, that's the girl you're going to marry. I thought, Mary, I'm playing basketball. I ain't even thinking about girls at all. Well, that Sunday she showed up at our church, and her dad became our first associate pastor. And five years later, I did marry that girl 47 years ago in May. And from going to Africa as a missionary to having six kids, my 19th grandchild going to be born this month. Everybody say, help him, Lord. But I need the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. I'm not smart enough to figure out my life. And so even today as I preach to you, I said, Lord, what would you have me to say and minister to the people? And he gave me that verse. So let me close with this verse. Walk in unity of the Spirit. With all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love. I like what Billy Graham's wife said. They interviewed her and they said, uh, Ms. Graham, have y'all ever talked about divorce, you and Billy Graham? She said, oh, no, we've never discussed divorce. Murder, Yes. How many of you kind of felt that emotion at times? But bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain, look at it, put that verse up for me if you would, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And that's how you walk in the Holy Spirit. He's like a bird on your shoulder. 
You know, if you just walk and that bird's on your shoulder, he's right there. But if you get mad and you get upset and you get furious and you get uh, all kind of stuff going on, all of a sudden you just kind of feel his presence lift. And you repent and you say, Lord, forgive me for grieving you. And his presence returns. So walking in the Holy Spirit, we got the love of God beaming from that tower. We got grace when we fail. And we have daily fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And he'll even tell you where you lost something. Because I do lose stuff at times. How about you? That spirit is here right now. If you're in this service and all you would say is, I'm facing the wrong tower. And I feel like I need to be thrown away. You came out on a very cold day because you're hungry for Jesus. The love of the Father, the grace of Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Would you bow your heads with me all across the room? There's some men in here. Some ladies, some young people. If you died tonight, God forbid, in your sleep you're not ready. You're not ready to face God because you're facing the wrong tower. And you need His love and His grace and His, His fellowship. If that is you, and you would say, Pastor, include me in a simple prayer of salvation. I want to turn to the right tower. You're going to feel the hands of your inward soul turning to the right time immediately when you turn to the cross. If that is you and you would say, include me in that prayer. It's January 1st. This is a wonderful time to reconsecrate your life to God. If you're away from God or if you've never given your life to the Lord, you're going to turn from the enemy's tower that's confusing you. And to the Lord, if that is you and you would say, please include me in that prayer. What I want you to do very simply, nobody's looking, is I want you to just slip up your hand right now where you're sitting and hold it up high right now. Just shoot it up straight in the air. So many people with their hands raised all across this room. Now you can put them down. You know, Jesus died naked on a cross. He was not ashamed of me and you. And he said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before the Father. If you raise your hand, I want you to do something else. On this first day of the year, I want you to say, I'm turning to the new tower, the cross, and I'm not ashamed of it. I'm making a change in my life. You raise your hand or you didn't and you wish you would have. I want you to stand in your seat right there in the building. Just stand up and make your stand for the Lord. Right there. That's right. No fear, they're standing all across this room. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That's right. That's right. Now, you guys, act like I'm the tower because I'm, 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 I'm crucified with Christ. I'm, I'm preaching the cross. You that are standing, would you walk a few steps and let me lay my hand on you and pray over you? As you walk, you're walking toward the new tower. Let's give them a good hand as they come. Come on, all of you guys that are standing, quickly, quickly. Every man, come on, give them a great hand clap. Yes, Lord. Come on, give them a great hand clap. They're still coming. People are getting saved on the first Sunday of this year, Victory. I'm decreeing this is a year of the double portion. Thank you, Lord God. Beautiful, beautiful. They're still coming. Come on, you ladies can come right over here if you don't mind. Just come right over here. I got to turn to the right tower. I got to turn. I got to feel it. And it's going to be so simple. God don't do anything complex. It's your will. Like the rudder on a ship. It's still coming. Dear ladies, come on, sweethearts, right over here. That's right. I got to get right with God. I got to get right with God. Thank you, Lord. Put your hand over your heart. Would you do that? Just close your eyes. The love of God come upon you right now. You say, my dad was real hard on me. Okay. But that's not the heavenly father. Don't equate the two. You're talking about hesed love, unconditional love. You are a creation of his, and he loved you before you got saved. And I want you to pray this prayer out loud with me, and would everyone join them? Say, Heavenly Father, 
Today I turn to the cross and away from darkness to your marvelous light. Let your love download in my heart. Let your love forgive me. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for your grace that you left heaven and you died in my place. I receive your blood. Sprinkle my heart clean from an evil conscience. Grace, come. And now I want you to just turn your hands over like, a, like somebody's about to hand you a gift. And pray this way, Holy Spirit, fill me today. I ask you to come and fill me. I ask you to fellowship with me. I need to hear your voice on a daily basis in the Scripture and in my prayer time. I bless them, Lord. I bless every one of them, all 14 of them standing down here receiving Jesus. We bless them today. Stretch your hand out toward them. Yeah, let's give them a hand clap. Oh, we can do better than that. Come on. What a blessing. What a blessing, you two beautiful ladies. Each one of you, we love you. We praise God for you. We got couples down here excited for you, young lady. Love you, love man. Love you guys. Praise God, dear brother. Hallelujah. What a blessing. What a blessing. Give me five. I love you, my man. God bless you. Thanks for checking out today's sermon and making it a priority in your life. For more encouragement throughout your week, be sure to follow us on social media at Victory Denver. We hope to see you on Sundays at 10 a.m. and right back here at Victory Church Online.